Let's get to our wrap the week segment. This is our normal Friday segment to try to look at how the markets have evolved uh, week to uh, week to week. Uh, and I've been hearing from a number of you. I know many of you watch the show live as we're broadcasting it on uh, Friday evening, but many of you watch over the weekend. And I would encourage you that uh, to hopefully have a time over the weekend, whether it's Friday, Monday, whatever, somewhere in between a time to analyze the charts and how they've evolved. Uh, and hopefully the show can help you do it. We asked you on a poll recently, what would you feel most comfortable shorting right now? It's a perfect segue into our uh, Wrap the Week segment. Your choices were uh, stocks, bonds, gold, or Bitcoin. The votes are in, and 45% of you said Bitcoin uh, as the uh, the far far outweighing the other ones. The other is pretty much split between stocks, bonds, and gold. I'm not super surprised because if you look at the charts, uh, you know, if you have those four charts, the SPY, the TLT, the GLD, and uh, Bitcoin, you know, dollar sign BTC USD, one of those four certainly looks the weakest. Uh, Bitcoin certainly, you know, uh, showing a lot of volatility, but testing key support after having come down so much and lost, losing, you know, 50% of its value. Gold and bonds on a relative basis, a little weaker than stocks for sure. And you've seen some rollover in uh, precious metals this week. Uh, but overall, I can't disagree. I did not answer the question, but if I did, I would most likely say Bitcoin as well. And, and it's it's important to remember on a, on a question like that, as we go to our wrap the week segment, you know, just because you would feel shorting it, I don't know if I would feel short, lifetime short uh, Bitcoin. I think overall, Bitcoin could certainly be much higher than it is today. Uh, uh, the, the whole implication of uh, the um, blockchain and technology and where it's going to hit other places, there could be other coins that far out perform Bitcoin over the long term. So I don't think it's the idea is dead, but it certainly had been frothy and certainly coming down to earth. And I don't believe that that's done based on my analysis of the charts. Let's wrap the week uh, very quickly. Look at what's happened today. We're going to focus on the uh, on the weekly returns and then we'll get to the mindful investor live chart list. To summarize today, market drifting higher is how I would describe it, up a third of a percent with the S&P closing just above 4280. Notably, the NASDAQ 100 was actually down today, down just about 1%. So not much, but certainly got to perform a mid caps far outperforming uh, the rest of the bunch up 0.9%. Very quickly with other asset classes, you have uh, yields going higher today. Uh, so if you're wondering why financials are at the top of the list today, this chart most likely uh, explains that. That's a big tailwind to the performance of financials. If yields are going back up, they were up below uh, or just below 1.5% uh, yesterday and now closing the week around one, uh, 50, sorry, 154 or so. Uh, the dollar, by the way, completely flat, just below 25 remaining where it was on the UUP. Gold and precious metals up a little bit today. So you had the GLD up 0.3%, but that's really the, the pattern that we've seen in gold over the last couple of days. You can see these little, uh, the little preview charts gapping up in the open, but then spending most of the day going down. Today was actually unique. The last four days, pretty much every day has closed near the lows. Today, we actually, uh, popped up a little bit going into the uh, to the close, but overall a uh, relatively weak and commodities as a whole uh, down today. Cryptocurrencies continuing to feel the weakness with Bitcoin now back uh, down around 32,000. This is down from around 34,000, uh, sorry, almost 35,000 at the close yesterday. Um, so certainly continuing to uh, show weakness. And again, I, I don't, while the, the, the strength or weakness of an individual day has a lot of different factors, I would say the overall uh, overarching trend in Bitcoin has been down. And I'm, I'm not surprised that days like this continue to happen. I think there's further weakness to be had there. Uh, and 30,000 for me is sort of that line in the sand on, uh, on the chart of Bitcoin. Very quickly with sectors, as I mentioned, is uh, financials, then a lot of defensive leadership like utilities, consumer staples, and real estate. That is a very different look at the top of the list than we've seen in a while. At the bottom, you have some of the growth sectors that have done the best recently, technology and communication services, uh, two of the bottom uh, three sectors. Let's quickly look at the wrap the week chart. So this is our chart looking at the returns from last Friday to where we're at today, just after the close uh, Eastern. Here's the S&P up point, uh, sorry, 2.8% for the week here in black. What underperformed uh, the S&P? Uh, most things actually. So emerging markets were up 2.4%. Here in purple, we have the NASDAQ 100 that was up 2.1% this week. Gold here, 1% uh, for the week. Uh, the rest were down on the week. Uh, you have the dollar uh, using the UUP as a proxy for that down 0.5%. Uh, and then here we have bond prices down 2.6%. A couple of things actually outperformed stocks this week. And in uh, brown, we have crude oil up 3.9%. And then finally, small caps up 
4.4. So out of this entire group, small caps were the uh, the leader. And even though they underperformed the S&P today, just up a, a little little bit above the zero level uh, today overall for the week, small caps certainly outperforming uh, large caps by a decent uh, decent gap there. If you look at uh, about a 1.6% difference from the uh, Russell 2000 to the S&P uh, this week. If we add Bitcoin in there, just if you're uh, looking at cryptocurrencies, certainly weaker and down uh, 10.3% for the week. And again, uh, not as bad yesterday. Today sort of gave a lot a lot of it up. So Monday and Friday really accelerating to the downside. You had a couple sort of recovery days in the middle there. But that sort of pattern with an acceleration moves to the downside and then a bit of recovery moves on the way up is really characteristic of a downtrend, which is, again, what I would argue a lot of those cryptocurrencies are, uh, are sort of in right now. Let's complete our wrap the week segment looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. If you've not seen the show on a Friday before, the way you get to this, by the way, is go to uh, stock charts, go to the top where it says articles, click on that, go to the upper right where it has all of the stock charts blogs and go to my page, which is called the Mindful Investor. You're going to get to this page, which is sort of my homepage for all of my content. And you'll see live chart list at the top, little gray button that'll get you right to uh, the, uh, the list that we're going to look at together right now. We're going to start with a weekly chart of the S&P using what I call the market trend model. This is a model I developed years ago. It is a, uh, you know, a very simplistic trend following model, but I've, I've found over my career simple tends to mean better. Uh, more complex uh, usually means it can it interpret a particular market or a particular set of circumstances probably more effectively. But if you really want to understand things uh, consistently over time and have a, a model that adapts to changing variables, which I would argue the markets are always in a uh, period of flux, then you want something more simple. More simple usually means more robust, which means it's going to uh, it's going to work better as the variables change. And so I have a simple trend following model using weekly moving averages. Overall, here's what it's saying: the long term model has been positive since last June. So now we're hitting a year, uh, just over a year in uh, in bullish territory. That turned uh, positive a couple months after the March. Uh, excuse me, the, um, oh yeah, the March 2020 low turned positive about in June and has remained positive since then. The medium term model for me turned negative in May, uh, about five weeks ago. Uh, it's turned negative three times since that March 2020 low. The first time was in October of 2020, the second time in February of 2021, the third time about a month ago in May of 2021. Now, in both of those previous uh, times that I mentioned about two to six weeks later, uh, the uh, the model turned back positive. And so it basically turned negative in the corrective period would turn uh, more positive as we would go back to new highs. It's interesting that the model has not turned uh, to new highs uh, yet, even though we're at all uh, all time highs in price. And that still doesn't bother me. I think for me, that medium term model for me is more risk on or risk off and and more maybe more to the point helps me to decide whether to focus more on potential reward or focus more on potential risk. The fact that it remains bearish here tells me to just keep focusing on risk potential. For charts that are working, there's no reason to sell them in this sort of scenario. It tells you to focus on lines in the sand, or as my former flight instructor used to say, when you're flying straight and level and everything is going well, that's the time to develop your emergency plan. That's how I would think of this here. This is telling you the conditions are similar to what we've seen at other topping patterns. So it's not telling you we're definitely going to go down, but it's telling you to focus more on the potential um, uh, breakdown opportunities. Finally, we have the short-term model turning back bullish uh, in the last week, and it turned negative as the uh, market pulled back last week, back positive. <laughs> Excuse me. And that's very simply looking at where we're at relative to the five-week exponential moving average. Overall, telling you that in the short term, the tactical read, the conditions are positive. The daily chart of the S&P, we've looked at most days uh, uh, this week on the show. And you know, again, I'm seeing a very consistent pattern with the S&P having impulse moves to the upside, having pullbacks to the 50-day moving average. That has happened so many times a uh, year to date. That's sort of the assumption, I think, uh, from here on out. You expect pullbacks to the 50-day. And, and so far, 100% of the time, the market has uh, repelled any attempt to break down through the 50-day moving average. I'm inclined to assume that that sort of trend is going to continue until proven otherwise. So new all-time highs uh, today and, and this week, certainly a positive. Uh, the fact that the market, uh, the S&P remains above its 50-day on pullbacks is certainly encouraging. Let's get to the less encouraging stuff. Example one is on this chart. We have a pattern right now, which is the same pattern we had in Q1 of 2021. The market making new all-time highs in April. But then every month after that, you continue to make new highs. But every time we make new highs, it's on lower momentum. That's called a bearish momentum divergence. It does not tell you the market is definitely going to go lower, but it's certainly what a top will tend to look like, right? An incline in price and a decline 
in the uh, in the momentum. You certainly saw that here in the first quarter, right? January, February, March of 2021. That did not result to the downside, obviously. And, and I tell you, when that cleared was when you broke to the upside. You had new highs in the S&P, and it was no longer a bearish divergence. The uh, RSI actually made new swing highs as well. We've not quite had that. So today, even with the new high this week, the uh, momentum is lower than it was earlier in June. So that is a chart I will definitely be watching and a signal I'll certainly be watching for next week. Some of these breadth indicators, including the ones we're going to look at here, aren't updated yet for today's close. It certainly could change the character, but something I was looking at going into the close today is whether or not the cumulative advanced decline lines would confirm this week's uh, new all-time high. So what happened, if you look back in uh, March, if you look back in April uh, and, be, and before that, the S&P going to new all-time highs, the cumulative advanced decline lines all going to new all-time highs as well. This is when I turn these all back to green, particularly here because the small cap index actually took a while to confirm the new high, but it finally did. And here in early May, you see all of these in the green indicating that price is going higher and the advanced decline lines are going higher as well. That is not the case right now. So on this week's new all-time high on the S&P and the same for the NASDAQ, none of the cumulative advanced decline lines are making new highs right now. Now, again, while that might just resolve itself over the next week, if prices go higher and stocks continue to accumulate, these will all naturally go higher as well. But at this moment, you're seeing a new high that is not yet confirmed by uh, confirmed by new highs of the advanced decline. Less. Well, it's not like a bearish divergence or anything. It's probably lesser than that. I call it a non-confirmation, which is sort of the potential warning sign. It's something to watch. And again, this is a chart I think it will be very interesting to watch going forward. So, you know, the breadth, not necessarily positive. It's more measured right now. One more to look at in terms of breadth. This is the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. We've looked at this chart before on the show uh, pretty regularly. 90% of the S&P as of Thursday's close trading above their 200-day moving average. That's remained fairly elevated, above 80% for you know, pretty much this entire year since uh, the fourth quarter of last year. But if you look, only 48%, sorry, 47% as of Thursday's close of the S&P 500 were above their 50-day moving average. It was above 90% about two months ago there in early April. And so in the last two months, you have a bunch of stocks that had been above their 50-day moving average that have not gotten back above them after breaking down. And that's a bit of a concern, right? Uh, you know, a, a peer of mine on the, uh, on, uh, on the Twitters, we're, we're talking about, uh, how if you test oh, back to the 2009 low, what happens every time that this indicator is above 90% and pretty much every time, I think there was one example maybe going back to 2009 where that happened and the S&P wasn't higher three months later. And I don't know how much that validates that as a bearish signal. All that tells me is the only times you're going to get the indicator above 90% is during a bull market phase. That's what that tells, uh, that's what, that's what that tells me. Um, the fact that we're below 50% right now is a, is a bit of a concern in my book. I'd much rather the market going to new highs supported by increasing uh, stocks going above their 50-day moving average. Sentiment we talked about yesterday, but overall bullish and not elevated. The last chart I want to look at before our break here is this one. This is looking at offense versus defense, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. These were both very close to breaking down at the end of May. They did not do so. They did not make a new swing low. And now they've returned back to the upside, showing overall investors are more on the offensive side of the consumer space. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.